The, the incredible concept of Jesus being 100% man and 100% God, 100% deity. You need to be here next Sunday morning because I know Pastor Tracy has done some tremendous research in that and he is going to be sharing uh, a message about the deity of Jesus Christ and the humanity of Jesus Christ. So don't miss that next Sunday morning. I tell you, he's going to go in depth with that, and you will enjoy that message so much. And then next Sunday night, Brother Sherman Morris will be sharing the word. So you've got some great pulpiteers next Sunday. Pastor Tracy in the morning, Brother Sherman uh, Morris at night. We will be away, but you're going to be in good hands with uh, these two wonderful brothers. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew in the second chapter. be looking this morning at verses 1 through 12. The Christmas story as told by the gospel writer Matthew this morning. And we just saw that powerful video with that beautiful, beautiful song, Mary, Did You Know? Did you understand who you were holding? And we, we love the story of, of Mary and Joseph and their trip to Bethlehem and all. A Sunday school teacher was asking her class, Class of children around the Christmas time, what was Jesus' mother's name? One child answered Mary, and the teacher said, very good. The teacher then asked, who knows what Jesus' father's name was? One little kid spoke up and said, Verge. Confused, the teacher asked, where did you get that, that Jesus' father's name, Verge? The little kid said, well, you know, they're always talking about Verge and Mary. <laughs> Only a child, right, would, would think of that. Some of you all would get it on the way home this morning. <laughs> Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2 this morning. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. Would you stand with me? Praise God as we share the Word of God together. Maybe we could bring up some house lights, a few lights this morning. It says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? 
We saw His star in the east and have come to worship Him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ child was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from, uh, from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense, or frankincense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I want to share a message this morning about the cast of Christmas characters and how God uses the various individuals in the Christmas story to speak to us today. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today through this glorious and wonderful Christmas story. I'm going to ask Pastor Tracy if he would at this time to add God, ask for God's blessing and that he would add his anointing to the preaching of the word this morning. Lord, again, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in the house of God for celebrating your birth. And God, we just ask a special anointing of your spirit, God, upon our pastor. Hallelujah. God, as he ministers the word of God, Lord, I just pray you prepare our hearts, God. Lord, to receive yes. this message. Hallelujah. God, and you will realize the true meaning of Christmas, God, for so many are just saying it's a holiday. Oh, God. Lord, God may we just boldly proclaim, Lord, this season, the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Yes. And we pray, God, and anoint Hallelujah. Him, Lord, as He just opens the Word of God up, and Lord, may you receive His blessing because we have been in Jesus. Amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. And it's so wonderful to have Sister Eleanor Meck with us in our service this morning. Right back over here. She is so happy to be back in God's house for Christmas. She's had to be away from us for a long time. But oh, we're so glad she's here. And Sister Berta here with us again this morning. Not been able to be with us here recently. Back with us. Praise the Lord. We're so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. Praise God. Well, let's look at this great Christmas story this morning. In addition to the Christ child, who of course is at the center of the Christmas story. How many realize there is no Christmas story without the Christ child, without Jesus? He's the reason for the season. He's at the center of the Christmas story, of course. But there are several very interesting groups of individuals also uh, in this story, the cast of characters that Matthew mentions and he brings forth uh, that, uh, in, in this message that God, I believe, would have us to look at this morning. In this passage, he would have us to look at this morning. And uh, Matthew mentions a number of different individuals. And I believe this morning they all have very unique significance to the Christmas story and very unique significance to who and what we are today in our Christian lives. And I believe God is wanting to challenge us this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to each and every one of us this Sunday morning, Christmas Sunday morning. Praise God. And it all depends on who and what we are in relation to these particular characters. And I believe that we're all going to discover here this morning that we may have something in common with one or maybe more of these individuals that lived so long ago and were such key components to the Christmas story. The first individual mentioned in this passage 
As we were reading down through the 12 verses there, the first 12 verses in Matthew chapter 2, the first one mentioned is the man known as Herod the king. What an interesting reaction Herod had to the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of Messiah, the coming of the Savior, the one to save this world from its sins. And Herod's reaction to the birth of Christ was one of anger and hostility. Anger and hostility. You see, Herod was afraid that when this little baby grew up, because so many people were talking about this little baby and talking about a king being born, he was afraid that when this little tiny baby, born in the humble trappings and surroundings of a, of a stable in Bethlehem, this Jesus person, when he got older, was going to interrupt and interfere with his life. He thought this one who they're saying of him, was born to be the king of the Jews. And of course, at this time, Herod is the king of the Jews. He thought, this child has the potential to interfere with my position, to interfere with my power, to interfere with my influence. And you know what? Herod was 100% correct. 100% correct. That little baby, that tiny little baby, born in a stable, Born in a barn, that little baby, not born of noble or royal birth there, that little baby totally and completely messed up Herod's life. He totally messed up his life. You know what he said right away, Herod, when he heard about the birth of Jesus? Let's kill him. Let's take him out. We can't have this child hanging around. We can fix this problem right here and we can fix it right now. I'm the king. I can order this child killed. Now this was not really unusual. You have to understand for this man named Herod, he had already had his own wife Miriam killed. Already had his own wife killed. We've seen a lot of stories, haven't we, in the news about people who have killed their wives, some of them on the, on the honeymoon. Some of you saw that story about that husband and wife that got married. They're on the honeymoon and she pushes the husband off a cliff to his death. How tragic, how horrendous and horrific that is. But he had had his wife Miriam killed. Now I don't know a whole lot about Miriam. Scholars don't tell us a whole lot and, and the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about Herod's wife. Maybe she was a nagging wife. I don't know. Maybe she was a backseat driver. I'm really not sure. I don't know too much about her personality. But I think offing her was probably a little extreme. Don't you think? That was just a little bit extreme. Most of us, most of us men would probably find a, you know, a little, little better way to handle the situation. Maybe have a little better response than that. But not only did he kill his wife, he had his wife's mother killed as well. Now, I've heard of being a little less than thrilled with your mother-in-law, but putting her on ice, that's extreme, isn't it? That's a little extreme. Maybe tempting sometimes, but a little extreme. He even had two of his own sons killed. So it wasn't just the wife, wasn't just the mother-in-law, but he had two of his own flesh and blood sons killed. So the one thing we can conclude, I guess, about Herod is that at least he was an equal opportunity assassin, if you know what I mean. He didn't just have it in for the in-laws. He had it in for his own flesh and blood, his own sons. You see, he thought his sons might have their eyes on his throne before it was time for them to inherit the throne. So he saw them with their eyes and thought they had designs on his throne. And so he said, I'm going to off them. I'm going to have them killed. Nobody is going to take my throne. Nobody is going to take my kingship. Not even my own sons. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to be the king. And so Herod was threatened by anyone that he thought might have their designs or their eye on his throne. And don't you know, when he heard this news about someone who was born and they were calling him the king of the Jews, he was threatened by Jesus, wasn't he? He was threatened. There's so many today in our world this, this morning that are threatened by Jesus. How many understand that to be true? People are threatened by Jesus. They really are. They don't want the demands of Jesus upon their lives. 
Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus makes some demands on our life to be a disciple, doesn't He? It's not an easy path. It's not an easy road. Folks, when you surrender your life to Jesus, it's not about your goals and your dreams and your wants and your desires anymore. It's all about pleasing the Master, isn't it? It's about dying to self, dying to our selfishness, dying to our self-centeredness, all of these things. And it's about living unto Jesus, living for His honor, for His glory. We don't want honor anymore. We don't want glory for ourselves. Everything we do is to reflect the glory to Jesus. Would you say amen? amen. So many today don't want these strict demands of following His laws. So many today say, I don't want anybody telling me how to live. Nobody is going to call the shots in my life except me. It's my life and I'm going to live it the way I want to live it. Uh, they don't want His life, the Christ life. Uh, they don't want His requirement of laying aside sin and living pure and doing things God's way. But guess what? If you're going to be a disciple and you're going to follow Jesus all the way to heaven, you've got to do it His way and not as Frank Sinatra saying, I did it my way. We've got to do it His way. But they never consider the fact that there are tremendous temporal and eternal blessings that come with dying to self and coming alive to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Folks, I wouldn't have it any other way in my life. I came to the cross of Calvary when I was five years old. And I said, Jesus, I want you to be the leader of my life. I want you to be the Christ, the Lord, the Master. I want you to be King of kings and Lord of lords in my life. And I have not regretted it one single second since I gave my heart to Jesus at the age of five. No regrets. Friends, it's a life of no regrets. Somebody say, man. Amen. Oh, there's, there's great blessings now. Temporal blessings and eternal blessings that come with serving Jesus Christ. If you haven't done so, I want to encourage you to dedicate the throne of your life and let Jesus get on the throne. Dedicate your life to Him. And let Jesus sit on the throne. Abdicate. Get off of the throne of your heart and let Jesus sit there. That's the only hope that you and I have this morning for lasting peace, lasting joy, lasting satisfaction. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love having Jesus on the throne. Don't you this morning? Praise God. He's going to stay on the throne of my heart and my life. Herod responded to Christ with anger and great hostility. And you know, we follow that path still yet today in 2013 to our own destruction. Oh, surrender to Jesus Christ. Oh, don't follow that path. Don't be a Herod today. Oh, there's millions of Herods all over the globe today that, that look at Christ with hostility and anger. Don't you try to tell me what to do. Don't try to run my life. I will call the shots. But oh, that path leads to eternal destruction. The second group mentioned in this passage, in the Christmas cast of characters, is the chief priests and the scribes. Their reaction to the birth of Christ was one of complete indifference and apathy. Complete indifference and apathy. I like what one old boy said, I used to be apathetic, but now I just don't care. <laughs> But they, had a, they, they couldn't care less that Jesus was born. You see, they were all taken up with their temple duties. They were taken up with their title. They were taken up with their self-importance and what they were doing and what they could do in the temple that would be seen of men. They were concerned about looking and appearing pious to other people. They were concerned about getting all their rituals right and... They were into all these legal discussions about the Old Testament law and, and theological debates. They were always ready to argue and to debate with others and to show off their knowledge of the Old Testament law. But their sole purpose in the religious hierarchy of their day was to prepare Israel for Messiah's coming. That was their real purpose. That's why they were in the religious hierarchy. They were to prepare Israel Get the Jews ready for the, the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
But as religious leaders, they allowed other duties to become so much more important than preparing for and looking for the coming of Messiah. Their priorities became misaligned there. And, and they, they really took their eye off the ball of what they were supposed to be doing. They lost the vision. They lost sight of the big picture of getting people ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of Messiah. But friends, let me tell you this morning, may it never, ever be said of us at Edgewood Assembly of God that we are religious, we are spiritual, we're pious people, but we fail to pay attention to the signs of the times around us. Never let us get so spiritual that we lose sight of, of the big picture, what really matters, what's important, uh, that we be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we never lose sight of the fact that we've got to keep our garments completely white uh, and spotless uh, and that we've got to live a holy life in an unholy world. Uh, we've got to be living for the coming of the Lord, looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we ought to be spiritual, but all oh, let's not be so pious that we're caught up in other things uh, and trying to impress people with our spirituality. But oh, let's have our eyes on the eastern sky saying, oh Lord Jesus, come quickly. We're ready for your coming. Oh, let us never fail to pay attention to the signs. Uh, folks, we are to discern the signs of the times and realize every single day that we live, we are one day closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we've got to be ready. We've got to get ready. We've got to stay ready and look for His soon return. Oh, may it never be said of us that we never give much serious thought that Jesus is to soon return to this earth. Uh, Friends, I want to shout it from the rooftops. Uh, every chance I get, He is coming. Hallelujah. He is coming for a spotless, glowing bride. Uh, he's coming for a church without spot and without wrinkle. Oh, that's the message of the hour. Get ready. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Occupy. Tell everyone you know that doesn't know Jesus. It's time to get right. It's time to know the Savior. Oh, our redemption draws nigh. His return, friends, is imminent this morning. Oh, not one more prophecy has to be fulfilled before Jesus can appear in clouds of glory to rapture His bride. His return is imminent. Hallelujah. He could be right at the door this morning. I'm looking for His coming this morning. Oh, I heard someone say recently, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm looking for the one who's going to take me up. Praise the Lord. What we do for Jesus as individual Christians, as members of Edgewood Assembly of God. Friends, if you're going to do something for Jesus, you're going to get involved in ministry. You're going to make a difference in the lives of people in your neighborhood, your community, in the lives of children, young people in this church. Whatever God's calling you to do, you need to do it now. You need to do it quickly. Tomorrow can be too late. Too many people are sitting around year after year saying, I'm praying about what God wants me to do. 10, 15 years later, they're still warm in a pew, still warm in a seat, but doing nothing for the kingdom of God what we need to do for Jesus we need to do it now Amen. folks can I tell you this morning we can't hold back we've got it right now give it everything we've got hallelujah everything we've got Jesus is coming soon yes. too often we allow the cares of this life uh, this life down here the junk the temporal stuff uh, of this world that has no lasting value no eternal value the enticements the priorities uh, of this world uh, we allow it to take preeminence uh, and to sap so much of our time and our energy uh, and our talents uh, over the fact that Jesus is coming soon uh, and there's work to be done uh, there's work to be done there's no time to sit in front of a TV for hours uh, sit in front of a computer screen for hours of playing meaningless games. It's time to work for the Lord. I don't ever want to be remiss in preparing for the Lord's soon return. Oh, friends, when we celebrate His first coming, we're also thinking about His second coming. The first coming of Jesus prepares us for the second coming. Oh, I don't want to be remiss. You know, so many people say to me, Oh, Pastor, I know I need to get more involved, but you know, i got so much to do. 
there's just so much around my house I've got to do and I've got this organization and I've got this thing and that thing over the school and this activity and I've got a taxi over here and taxi somebody over there and I know I should be in church more but it's just so hard to find the time to come to the house of God anyway pastor you you know how it is you you know you know friends all I know is that the Bible says in Hebrews 10 25 not forsaking the assembling together of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and all the more as you see that day approaching. What is the writer to Hebrews saying there? Knowing, understanding today the signs of the times and knowing that Jesus is coming back soon. Friends, we don't go to church less than we used to do. We go to church more than we used to go. We don't fellowship less with other Christians. We fellowship more with other Christians. We need to be together more as a church to encourage one another more, to build one another up more in the most holy faith. We need to reach out more to the lost that are undone and not prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that are on their way in a mad dash to a devil's hell. We need to go after them and say, Jesus is coming. Jesus loves you. I want you to know there is a free gift of salvation. You need to receive Him. He's coming back. We need to do more to reach lost people. God help us that we never grow complacent. Amen. God help us we never get indifferent uh, about serving the Lord, about the coming of the Lord, about the importance of Chris Christian service uh, and evangelizing the lost. Don't ever let us become complacent, complacent and indifferent uh, about the importance of Jesus Christ in our lives. When we're confronted with Christ, when we're confronted with matters of the eternal kingdom of God, we can't afford to get complacent. We can't afford to be apathetic any longer. This second group, the chief priests, the scribes, they were indifferent toward the baby Jesus. How tragic. Religious leaders, religious leaders in the temple, indifferent. They were supposed to be looking for the Messiah. They were supposed to understand all the signs of Old Testament law. They were supposed to know the prophecies backward and forward. They should have seen it. They should have been on top of it. And they missed it. They were apathetic. The Messiah came. And they didn't even know and understand who He was. God help us to have a renewed passion this Christmas as a church for Jesus Christ. His presence his power, His glory, hallelujah. All oh, that is be hungry and thirsty for more of Jesus in the church. All oh, that is be hungry for revival, for God to come back, hallelujah, into the house of God and all oh, to clean house and to come and to have His will and His way in every heart and every life and take away the complacency and the lethargy and the apathy and set us on fire again. Praise God for Jesus Christ. You see, what you do with Jesus will make you or it will break you for all of eternity. This third group, of course, is the group we have come to know as the Magi or the wise men. Scripture makes it clear these men did not come with hatred. They didn't come to Bethlehem with hostility like Herod did. They didn't come with apathy, complacency like the scribes and the teachers of the law, but all oh, they came with a sense of adoration and worship. A sense of adoration and worship. They were awestruck by this child. Friends, there's something wrong with you this morning if you're still not awestruck with Jesus and His presence and His glory and sensing that He is here in this place or He is in your midst. Oh, friends, we ought to be all struck with Jesus every single day. He's as great today as He ever was. Hallelujah. We ought to be all struck with Him and say, Oh, Jesus, I need to encounter Your glory. I need to encounter You in a way every day. Oh, that changes my life, that transforms my attitude, my spirit, my priorities, everything in my life. You see, these men came 
about a thousand miles, about a two years journey in that day, they came to worship Him and to kneel at His feet. Kneel at His feet this morning, church. Could we just realize as an entire body of believers, there is only one proper response when we behold and we encounter as we so often do in the services here and we need to so much even more often behold the glory of God when God speaks to us in messages in tongues and interpretations and prophetic word and we know that the Lord is right here and He's speaking to us and He wants to envelop Him not envelop us in His love all oh, that we would realize that the only proper response when we behold His glory, His personhood, His nature, when we sense His very presence, that our only response must be worship Amen. and adoration. Amen. May we never rush worship. May we never rush time to adore Him, to magnify Him, to give Him glory. Hallelujah. To get lost in His presence, to where nothing else matters but the presence of Almighty God in our lives. Oh, I think about the wise man. Came a thousand miles. Could have taken him as much as two years just to come and kneel at his feet. Sometimes we have problems driving ten minutes in the rain to get to church. Come on, somebody. We let the least little thing keep us home from church. The least little aggravation at home. Oh, I can't make it. It's inconvenient for me to come. They came a thousand miles. Amen. We can't come one mile, five miles, ten miles to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oh, friends, it's a privilege to come here and to sit at His feet and to kneel before Him and to adore Him and to love on Him and to experience Him. Hallelujah. Oh, it's the greatest privilege there is in this world is all to experience and encounter the supernatural power and glory of Almighty God. We are a privileged people. We ought to be willing to, to drive in 10 feet of snow or walk across the snow with snowshoes to get here. Somebody say amen. Oh, friends, we need to realize we have a privilege to worship Him. Scripture tells us the wise men brought gifts. The first gift they brought was gold. This signified quite simply that they acknowledged Him, the wise men, as the King that He was. They acknowledged that He was the King, not a King. They knew that He wasn't just a King, not just another King. He was the King. Hallelujah. The King. The fact of the matter is, in those particular times, in that particular culture, you did not approach a king in those days without a gift of gold. You would be stopped at the palace door and there would be no admission even into the palace if you didn't come with a gift of gold in your hand. That's how you reverenced the king. That's how you acknowledged His kingship. You came with gold. Jesus was king when He was laid in Bethlehem's manger 2,000 years ago. And let me tell you, He is king this morning. Hallelujah. He is king over His church. He is king over the nations. He is king over this world. Oh friends, we have commercialized and cursed His name beyond recognition. Our world has tried to belittle Jesus and poke fun at Him and poke fun at Christians for worshiping Him and tried to bring Him down to such a common level and made Jesus a punchline in a joke. But let me tell you, in Philippians 2.9, oh, this is what we need to keep in mind. The world can curse if they want to. They can trivialize. They can commercialize. But Philippians 2.9 says, God has highly exalted Him and given Him a name that is above every name. That at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and even things under the earth. Oh, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus as Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what people in this world think of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. The God of the universe has exalted Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Oh, hallelujah. He's the king this morning. Uh, friends, you can hate him this morning, uh, and he's still the king. Uh, you can take him or leave him, uh, but he's still the king this morning. Uh, religious leaders and politicians uh, and all kinds of executioners alike uh, have found out you can kill him to try to wipe him off the face of the earth, to do away with him, uh, to do away with his memory, to get people to forget about him and to stop worshiping him. Uh, you can kill him, but that still won't be thrown, my Jesus. Hallelujah. Because I'll tell you what, if you execute Jesus, he'll just end up walking out of the grave. Hallelujah. With the keys of death, hell, and the grave swinging at his side. Hallelujah. He is the king over death. He's king over hell. He's king over the grave. He's king over all things. King of kings. And Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Why is He King of Kings and Lord? How? How is this so? A baby born in a stable. How could it be so? Because He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, hallelujah. To the glory of God the Father. Established as such by God. And He shall reign forever and forever. Oh, I love the crescendo of the hallelujah chorus. I never get tired of hearing that song, uh, the hallelujah chorus, because it builds to that glorious crescendo. He shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Throughout all of eternity, He is King of kings and He is Lord of lords. They came with gold because He was the King. They came with frankincense. That's a gift, tradi gift traditionally given to priests. It signifies Jesus is our great high priest. That's what frankincense signified. He's our great high priest. They were acknowledging Him as the great high priest. You know, it was used, frankincense was used by the priest in temple sacrifice and worship as a sweet perfume, a fragrance offered up to God to take away the stench of the burning animals and so forth that were in there and so that God would be pleased. They wanted to offer a sweet smelling savor up to the nostrils of God. So they used frankincense. The Latin word for priest is pontifex, which means, I love this, bridge builder. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? He is our bridge builder this morning. He spans that great gulf, that great chasm between God and man that nothing else and no one else could ever bridge and bring together. The gulf was too wide. It was too great a chasm. Nothing else would do but Jesus. Hallelujah is the bridge builder that takes your hand and lifts it up and takes the hand of God and brings it down and unites the two. Hallelujah. And gives us standing with the Holy God. Glory to God. Oh, He's the bridge builder to make a way where there was no way. There was no way. He connects. Every day, friends, He connects your prayers to the ear and the heart of the Father. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus connects your voice, your petition. As it goes up, Jesus lifts it higher. Praise God. And He makes sure that it finds the ear of God the Father. Finds the heart of God the Father. He's how we get to God. He's the only way we get to God. Praise God when we couldn't go to Him. Oh, hallelujah. 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, He came down to us. He's my bridge. He's your bridge this morning. He's the bridge that gets us from little old Edgewood all the way to the throne room of God in the third heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, that's quite a distance. But oh, Jesus can bridge the gap. The third gift the Magi brought was a strange gift. It seemed kind of odd, a little out of character from the other two. Gold for a king. Frankincense for a high priest. It was a gift of myrrh. Myrrh wasn't a gift that you gave to someone who was alive. You see, myrrh was used in those days to embalm dead bodies. It was a sign to the world that Jesus had come for the purpose of dying. So it was in fact appropriate. That's why Jesus came. 
He was born not to just live. He was born to die for your sins and mine. Praise God. And this was a sign that He knew it. Jesus understood it. And because of that willingness to go to the cross in our place for us, to become the penalty for our sins, He has become our Savior. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. He came to die that you and I could live. Hallelujah. He crawled as it were over the balcony railing of the beauties and glories of heaven. And He came down and down and down and down, way, way down, all the way from heaven's splendor to a barn, a lowly, smelly barn and stable with smelly animals, the most humblest of circumstances on earth in the form of a newborn baby. And when He came down, He gave us the potential to finally get up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To get up from our shame. To get up from our guilt. To get up from our hopelessness. To get up from our failure. To get up from our defeat. When we've been knocked down by the enemy. Jesus says you might be down, but you're not out. Because I'm here to lift you back up again and push you back in the race. Hallelujah. And one day soon and very soon, praise God, we're going to go up. Hallelujah. We're going up all because His grace has been extended to us. Hallelujah. David Peterson, former pastor, Spokane, Washington, told about a time when he was preparing his sermon. His little daughter came in and said, Daddy, can we play now? You said you would play with me today. He said, Honey, I'm awfully sorry. I'm right in the middle of preparing this sermon. It's taking a little longer than I thought. And, but I, I think in about an hour I can play with you. She said, Okay, when you're finished, Daddy, I'm going to give you a great big hug. He said, oh, thank you so much. He went to the door. He went back to his sermon preparation. And these are his words describing it. He said, then she did a U-turn and came back and gave me a chiropractic bone-breaking hug. And he said to her, honey, you said you were going to give me a hug after I finished. She said, daddy, I just wanted you to know what you have to look forward to. <laughs> Hallelujah. One meaning of Christmas is that God wants us to know in His first coming, in the birth of Jesus, through His first coming, how much we have to look forward to in the great and glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody ought to be shouting about now. Hallelujah. Oh, how wonderful. To remember that when we couldn't rise to meet God where He is, He came down to where we were. When we were incapable of becoming like Him in our own strength, He humbled Himself to become flesh like us so that He could help us to become like Him. So we could live where He is now for all of eternity. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Herod rejected the Christ outright. The priests and scribes, they refused to accommodate Him in their theological structure. They didn't have room for Jesus. Oh, can I tell you, be like the wise men. Seek Him out today. Kneel at His feet. Offer Him your heart. Let Him be Lord of everything in your life today. Your life is the greatest gift you can ever give. To Jesus. Your whole life. Your time. Your treasure. Your talent. Give Him your whole life and say, Jesus, it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to You. You tell me what to do with my life. You lead the way. And I will follow. I want every head bowed, every eye closed all over this place this morning. Praise God. Oh, this is Christmas Sunday. Oh, what a great service. What a great place this is to be this morning. I feel God. I feel Him in this place. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. Hallelujah. Jesus is here this morning. What an incredible series of life, life cycle events there are in the person of Jesus Christ. He was born to die so that we who were spiritually dead in our sins 
could rise to new life, eternal life. The miracle of natural birth and the miracle of spiritual birth, being born again, they're both accomplished only by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. With Jesus' ultimate death on the cross, the Holy Spirit shows us how much God loves us. The same Holy Spirit that was at work at the birth of God's Son is the whole same Holy Spirit that wants to bring new life to those who believe this morning. I ask you right now, friend, is your life lacking in joy and lasting peace? Through His great sorrow, through His great suffering, He's able to bring you eternal joy. His everlasting peace only comes from sins forgiven and His everyday presence coming into our lives. Make this the greatest Christmas ever by receiving the greatest gift ever offered. The gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, the gift of the presence of Jesus in your life every single day. I wonder right now as heads are bowed, eyes closed, I wonder if there might be someone here that would lift a hand this morning and with that upraised hand say, Pastor, I want that joy. I want that peace. I need to know I need to know beyond any shadow of a doubt when I leave this world and I stand before the eternal judge of the universe, I need to know that I am accepted. I am accepted by a holy God. I need to know that there's a place reserved for me in heaven so that I can live with Him eternally. Can I see your hand right now? You say, I'm not absolutely sure of my salvation. Would you lift your hand right now? Right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this morning. The Holy Spirit is dealing, I know, I know He's dealing with hearts right now. Oh, is there anyone that would be honest enough to lift a hand and say, Pastor, I need Jesus. Or Pastor, I need to come back to Jesus. I once served Him. I used to be on fire for Him. But I've drifted away. I'm not living for Him anymore. In the next series of events in the life of Jesus, Joseph and Mary began to travel and the Bible says they left Jesus behind. They left Him behind. They went a whole day's journey and didn't even realize that Jesus was no longer with them. I believe I'm talking to some folks this morning that have left Jesus behind somewhere. You've left Him behind. You started to chase other dreams, other things in this life that really don't matter. They're temporal. They're not eternal. And you've left Jesus behind. He's not with you right now. You say, Pastor, I want to come home. Can I see your hand right now? No one's looking around. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. This is a decision between you and God and this preacher this morning. Is there one that would lift a hand and say, Pastor, you're talking to me this morning. You're talking to me. Can I see your hand? I need prayer this morning. Yes, yes. I need prayer this morning. I want to make sure that I walk out of here with the greatest Christmas gift that could ever be given. The greatest Christmas gift I could ever receive. I want to make sure that I have that gift in my possession when I walk out of this building this morning. I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave here without Jesus firmly positioned on the throne of my heart. All oh, friends, make it the best Christmas, the greatest Christmas you've ever enjoyed by welcoming Jesus into your heart. Is there someone else? Lift a hand this morning. I want to surrender all. Maybe you love Jesus, but you just really haven't given Him everything. You really haven't made Him Lord of your life. Lord of your time. Lord of your treasure. Lord of your talents. You haven't made Him Lord of all. Can I see your hand and say, Pastor, I want to make Him Lord. I want to make sure that He has all of me. All of Jesus has all of me this morning. Can I see your hand? Praise God. Praise God. As Sister Mary begins to lead us in silent night, and most of us know the words, and maybe we can even put them up on the, on the screen where we can all begin to sing softly. So we sing this great Christmas carol. Praise God. If you're the, from the first note, when we first begin to sing, if things are not absolutely right with God in your life this morning, you're not where you need to be with the Savior today and you want to come to Jesus, 
Ask Him. He's the only one that can forgive you of your sins. His blood is the only blood that can cleanse us from our sins. He is the only Savior there is. There's no other way. There's no plan B, plan C. There's plan A. That's Jesus. He is your only Savior. But oh, when you come to Him, confess your sins. Admit to your sins and turn from those sins and say, Jesus, I want you to save me. I want, I want you to forgive me of my sins. I repent of them. I turn from them. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior today. Be my Lord. He'll change your life completely. You'll never be the same. He'll come in and transform you. There'll be an overflowing joy. There'll be a peace you didn't have before. Some of you know. You know that peace. You've known it. You don't have it now. You've drifted. You need to come back. Let's sing that together this morning. And if you don't want to come alone, ask the person next to you. If you know you need to be at the altar, you ask the person next to you, would you go with me? Somebody in front of you, behind you, to your left, to your right. I know somebody will be glad to come with you. If you don't want to come alone, but you come to this altar, an altar worker, someone will come right alongside. A ministry staff member, an altar worker, a deacon will come. And they'll begin to pray with you. They'll explain salvation to you completely. If you say, I really don't understand it. They'll patiently explain it to you and help you to understand the greatest decision you'll ever make. Let's sing that together. Praise God. All of us singing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus came on that silent night. Thank God He came. He came born to die. Hallelujah. Born to rule in our hearts. Oh, if you're not right with Jesus, you're not where you ought to be, would you come? Make your way to this altar. Maybe you've got some issues in your life. Maybe you've given your heart to Christ. You're still battling with old sinful habits. Still battling with areas of the old life. You have issues that you need to bring to Jesus. Habits that need to be broken. Addictions that need to go. Maybe just some stress in your life you need. You need the peace of God again. Praise God. If you're here and you have a need of any kind and you want someone to pray with you, would you come to this altar right now? You have a need in your life. Jesus, hallelujah, the bridge builder, the Savior, the healer, the deliverer, the provider. Maybe you're stressed. You don't know. You don't know how to pay your rent. You're having trouble looking at the future, wondering how you're going to pay the bills, how it's all going to work out. You're wondering if your marriage can be saved. You've got children outside the ark of safety. You've been praying. Oh, you want them to come into the kingdom, into the ark of safety. You've got those wandering ones, the prodigals. And oh, you're so concerned. You want them to know the Christ of Christmas. Would you come? Would you come with your broken lives, your broken hearts, your anxieties this morning, your physical needs? Would you come right now? As our altar workers come, hallelujah, as our church leaders come, would you come this morning? Oh, Jesus is here to meet needs. Whatever your need is, Jesus has the answer. Maybe no one else has the answer. No one else has the authority. But oh, my Jesus knows. He already knows your hurts. He knows your need. He knows your situation. He's the only one that can do anything about it. But oh, He's powerful enough. He's knowledgeable enough. Hallelujah. He's wise enough. He knows how to meet that need. Oh, would you come this morning? You need healing in your body. Oh, the Christ of Christmas is here. The Christ of Christmas is here this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. I want to invite us right now at the close of this great Christmas Sunday service. This Christmas celebration today, I want to invite everyone real quickly, and we're going to sing, Oh, come, let us adore Him this morning. Oh, let's do as the wise men did. Let's press in as close as we can around the altar. If you're not able to come right where you're seated, would you sing it? Would you declare His glory? Would you worship Him? Would you praise Him? Everyone that can, would you come around this altar just for a few minutes? Let's come shoulder to shoulder. Brothers and sisters, let's come around this altar. Oh, hallelujah. Let's sing that great anthem, that great carol. 
Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. It's all about Him this morning. Let's come. Oh, declare it. Let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Let's come, oh, come all be faithful. Oh, come. Christmas messages I've ever heard in my life and I want him to come. Dad, would you just close us with prayer this morning on this great Christmas Sunday and we have at the doors, we have some newsletters for you from Pastor Tracy and myself and we have a gift for every family at the door. Make sure that you get your gift before you go. Praise God. And just on behalf of the staff and the board members here, we wish each and every one of you a Merry Christmas but we hope we'll see many of you Again tonight, 6.30, in the smaller sanctuary, we're going to be over there watching a wonderful Christian Christmas movie, having a wonderful time of food and fellowship. Do join us tonight, but God bless you. Dad, would you close us and take us home in prayer? Praise God. God is good. Um, Lord, we thank you for this Christmas service how much it means to be to know the Lord. We pray that if any of those that are in this service today have not found that joy and peace of knowing the Lord, we pray that this will be the day when they will invite you into their hearts. Now, Lord, go with us. Watch over us. Protect us. Give us a safe journey to our various locations. And may we Come back the next appointed time. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.